Hello and welcome back to the CSC Talk podcast and qualification confirmed after an incredible victory against Salisbury tonight. And joining me today, a very special guest, RJ, known as RJ Good Things from Twitter. And if you don't, I, I mean, it'll be very rare if if you follow our content and don't know RJ. He's he's he's, he's one of the best content creators on Twitter and on on uh, social media. Uh, he's he's part of a podcast as well and uh, a part of Talk Chelsea as well. I'll let him ex- introduce himself. Uh, hopefully, I've done I've done justice to to uh, him and his content that that you guys you guys see on a regular basis. RJ, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? How has it been? And it's good. So it's great to have you on the podcast. Oh, thanks very much for the invite, Mohammed. As we we're saying offline, it's been long overdue, and that's because of my unusually busy calendar but it's a pleasure to join you and to hopefully provide some great content for your loyal listeners and yeah overall from my perspective very happy with the result which we'll unpack of course and just a little bit about myself to your viewers so yes I am a also a content provider I like to write articles I like to appear on channels and podcasts and I do co-host one called it's a football thing where I represent the Chelsea community hopefully somewhat well and I am joined by two co-hosts, unfortunately, a Gooners fan and a Manchester United fan. So if you want to have some Premier League content and a little bit of Chelsea deep dive, come and have, give us a follow. I can I can confirm the content is amazing and, and you're doing justice to to uh, to social media with your content. But our, yeah, getting into the game, uh, we'll we'll start off with the Lioness, but just a bit of an overview uh, great goals from Kovacic and Havertz, a few defensive concerns, which we'll also discuss into this podcast, and and a few eyebrows that were raised when when the lineups were announced with those wing back situations. But uh, RJ, going into the lineups, you know, it was a very different lineup compared to what we've seen in the Premier League. Uh, and going three at the back with with Sterling and Pulisic as wing backs, did you think it was going to work as well as it did? I guess today, and Pulisic and Sterling both playing out of their natural position. Yeah, and no, it was a very interesting lineup. And a good friend of mine, Travis Flock, as well, who I also co host with the Balanced Blues Brothers, I highly recommend them, actually called it beforehand. And I think when you look at Graham Potter's um, reflections before the match, the key was around getting that width of the pitch because Salzburg defend in a very narrow shape. And, and we saw that tonight. There was a lot of narrowness, a very compact, structured way of defending. So it was so important that we had some really astute dribblers and pacey wingers playing out of position, admittedly. Although Christian Pulisic has experience in the wing back area, although it's not his preferred one. And Raheem Sterling, look, I'll, I'll put it out there. I think he was better in terms of his defensive responsibilities. wasn't perfect. Did get caught out a couple of times, and Pulisic as well. You would argue for the for the goal that Salzburg did um, score because he was slightly off the pace and allowed that cross in. But overall, I thought the two lads worked quite well in very unfamiliar positions. Yeah, exactly, because obviously it's not their natural position. So we can expect some defensive errors or some some issues in de- defensively, but attacking-wise as well, they were quite great supporting an attack. Pulisic, I thought today is where, again, yes, it was a bit... Uh, it, 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 I'm, I mean, I'm in in Pulisic's shoes. It, it it must be a bit frustrating not having that goal or that assist to just go go back to go back to London tonight and and really cement his place. But uh, a great performance by him again, supporting role that he played, helping out in attack, and and that's what you need from someone like Pulisic. And and obviously those goals and and assists will come, but playing as a right wing back and and it's not it's never going to be an easy task uh living up to what Reese James has, has provided for Chelsea and whoever comes in that position and I know Pulisic is a far fetched one you know as uh people go go after Asby for not uh producing as much uh, as much of an output than uh, as as Reese James but it was it was nice to see a lineup where we gave players chances as well. And I was kind of kind of surprised with the Bamiang playing because I, I really mm. thought Broya might have gotten the head start ahead of uh Bamiang, but I think he wanted to go with the two up front with Havertz as well. And and it kind of worked because Havertz did regain some sort of form. He was he was quite he, he played quite well today compared comparatively to that Brentford game where uh, I think a lot of fans had a lot of complaints and even himself he knows that it wasn't the best of his games. So your quick, your quick thoughts on on Aubameyang and Havertz starting up front rather than Broya and and, and Havertz maybe. 
Yeah, yeah, and no, it's a lot of conjecture about the forward positions for us at the moment because, as we all know, as Blues fans, we quite haven't solidified who should be our starting forwards. Um, I have it. I've put on the record many times. I'm not quite sure what he is yet, apart from a super talented player. He's just yet to fully realise that potential. But potential can only get you so far, particularly in a heavily scrutinised league such as the Premier League. So I think it's time is slowly diminishing for Kai Havertz to be able to produce and, and deliver on that promise. And tonight's performance goes a long way in validating some of the belief or the continued belief that not only Graham Potter has shown, but Thomas Tuchel had shown, Frank Lampard before him had shown, who obviously brought him into the club. So I do feel sorry for Armando Abroya that he didn't get the start because his cameos for me have produced glimpses of some real um, positive dominant style of forward play. Although there are question marks about some of his decision making, which is a little bit due to him being inexperienced and finding his feet in a new team, new culture. But overall, I think tactically speaking, it made a lot of sense when you when you break it down, Abamyang and Havertz, because both are creative minded players. Where I'd say Armando Broy is more of a powerhouse out and out forward. So I think having Abamyang and Havertz work hand in hand and be able to link up more naturally with your six and your um, Sterlings out wide, it just inherently made a lot more sense that they would be the ones that start to help to help um, break down what was a very structured um, Salzburg defence and bringing Amanda one at the latter stages when we were looking a little bit out of energy also made sense. So overall, I think Graham Potter got that decision right. Yeah, and I think because of Gallagher playing in behind the two, we needed we needed a few uh, we needed a player who could who could support those passes and get to the end of those balls. And as you mentioned, Armando Broya is more of a uh, someone creating a chance for him rather than Havertz maybe trying to open up spaces and stuff. So mm-hmm. it, the decision was was the was the correct decision, and you have to kind of look at the way. Uh, Salzburg lineup as well because they had they they did trouble us in that first in that uh, home home uh, fixture I, I will say and obviously it was Potter's first game we can say that that it was just his first uh, first game at Chelsea had hadn't been a long time since he took over but uh, the Chelsea that we saw against Salzburg that week is is a very different Chelsea from what we saw tonight which is which was quite a positive to take after those two draws at Brentford and Man United and them having three in midfield, four in the back, just meant that we needed more attacking players to try and get in, get in, uh, get in behind their defense, and and that's what exactly what we did. Because I will mm. say today, the passing in between the front three and and attacking players looked so synonymous. Those those chances that we created for Abamyang, and if one of them did actually get get in get in uh, get in behind the goalkeeper, and credit to Cohn, uh, the goal their goalkeeper who who made some incredible it's saves brilliant. today. I think I think yeah. he's getting some inspiration from Kepa, but um, just on that, yeah. I was just going to mention um, on on Kepa because I'm sure we'll talk about him. But some of those passing sequences we saw, particularly in that first half with Aubameyang's save chance from Cone, it all started from the back. There was some really nice passing between Silva, Jorginho, Kepa. And you will notice, and this has been a theme, which is another account I follow on Twitter is at CFC Central, so Sam, um, a familiar pattern that we've been seeing under the Potter regime is us being able to bring the opposition into one quadrant of the field and, and bring all of their players to one area and play our way out and then switch the ball across where we've got a lot of unoccupied space. And that's what led to that opportunity with Habits running in behind and playing that nice pass to Aubameyang, who unfortunately, I think, took a bit of a heavy first touch before he set himself. And it was a great save, but had that gone in, I dare say that would have been one of the highlight reels for all season. So it was just a great little sequence to highlight that Kepa's improved form it's not just about his shot-stopping ability, but his ability to play short at the back because his long-range passing tonight wasn't great. And it's one of those things where I'm quite mindful of where there's a lot of criticism on Mendy, which is understandable because of his confidence. But there seems to be a lot of commentary about Mendy is inferior in terms of the distribution. But I think 
Kepa is good in that area, although his long range passing hasn't been great. And that was again evident tonight. But his short range passing, I think, has been a real point of difference because we do seem to like to invite a lot of pressure and try to beat the trap, which he's a part of. So, yeah, I just thought I'd highlight that. Yeah, Kepa is someone who has generally struggled with with what you've what you've been explaining, but as well as the aerial issues that we've got with Kepa sometimes, Silva and the defenders having to come in to rescue. But it's 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 a weird conversation to have because I know we're going to get into this in detail as well with with a few questions that have been asked on Twitter uh, as well. For those if you're if you're not following us, make sure to follow us where you can drop your questions in and, and we can uh, ask ask our guests and and answer those questions in detail over here as well. But Kepa and his aerial aerial deliveries are an issue. And, and we've seen that, as you mentioned, CFC Central, I think he pointed this out as well. And it's it's a conversation where Kepa has been so great with saving those shots and in, 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 in goal that do you want to risk bringing Mendy in just because he's he might be a little bit better in in commanding commanding inside the box or uh, making dealing with those aerial deliveries. However, Kepa is someone who can be incredible when it when it comes to set pieces and and crossing uh, issues that that might be faced by Chelsea. So it's it's a good headache to have. I must say for for Potter to to pick between the two goalkeepers and Kepa. You know he's been incredible uh, throughout these throughout throughout Kepa, uh, Potter's time at Chelsea so far because in in so many games he's kept so many clean sheets and going 600 minutes without a goal conceded before that Casemiro goal. And even then it was a very unlucky goal to concede is, is an incredible stat. So uh, kudos to him for, for what he's been doing. And and the way you said Potter changing how we move the ball upwards from defense. And, and I, I must say what I've noticed a lot as well. And I think a lot of people have noticed is there's not a lot of back passes happening. Now Chelsea aren't scared of getting in behind defenses, making those passes and moving the ball much higher up the pitch compared to in Tuchel's time or uh, previous managers where we would back off every time there was there was some press from from oppositions there was uh, any any intensity from the opposition would mean the back the ball would be in behind uh with either the goalkeeper or the back four trying to just uh, wait it out or try and find that space but now we can see that that players are trying to dribble past the past opposition trying to create those chances and attacking and that's what we saw in the first half even though uh, Salzburg were pass were pressing really high, they were trying to do what Man United did, and obviously they didn't have that intensity as Man United. But that Kovacic goal and that passing for that goal really showed how we got got ourselves out of that situation and and got that. But uh, moving into the Kovacic goal, what a goal that was! And and <laughs> as they say, when he scores, he scores those beautiful and magnificent goals. Uh, your thoughts on on Kovacic and his goal and his performance today? I'm such a huge fan of our Croatian sensation, Kovacic. And I know he's got the ability to, to have the silky dribbling skills and his passing range has improved dramatically. And well, to qualify that, it might not have improved dramatically, but what has improved is his ability to use his passing range more frequently. And that's really started last season. So it's a credit to Thomas Tuchel as well for helping him find that confidence in himself. But we've seen in recent games in particular, when Kovacic is not on the field, we lose that steel and presence there. We're not perfect, and we'll go on to that in terms of the frailties that we have shown in this game, and we did concede a fair few chances, and I know Travis brought that up as well. But I think with with Matteo in the team, he, he's, he's actually a unique specimen in terms of he does have an incredible amount of athleticism, his ability to be able to beat the trap, press trap, and just dribble his way out of danger. Like we mentioned, his passing. And then again, it was uh, the goal was as a result of being able to get a number of bodies in the box competing for those second balls and being in the right place at the right time. So I dare say, how often have we been critical as Chelsea fans for our inability to have more shots centrally from range, where we've been overly concerned about trying to play and pass our way into the goal rather than taking our chance from range and being able to fashion a goal from that. So I think with Matteo, again, he scored another worldie, but I think that's as a result of Graham probably saying to the troops, we need to have more presence there and we need to take our chance more often. And what a first time side foot into the corner, top, top finish. But 
I'm not surprised because of his ability. What I am surprised is that we don't see it more often. And that obviously goes goes for, for Kai Havertz, who's scored an unbelievable goal, which we'll touch on. But overall, Kovacic, when he stays injury-free, he's not the complete midfielder. But what I would say is that he's at the moment our most informed midfielder. And when he's not playing, that presence in the middle is definitely missing. So... Yeah, big up to Matteo and long may his great form continue. You're right in saying that the issues a lot of fans have pointed out and a lot of criticism goes towards us not creating those chances, not having those final passes and taking those chances that we get. And tonight we can't really complain because Potter really set us set us perfectly to create those chances. And and I, if I'm not wrong, we had 11 or 12 shots on target uh, most of them from Aubameyang being concerning ones and, and causing a threat to oppositions because that's what you want as as an opposition. They're they're always going to be wary of the shots that are that are being shot from the impact that they the you can have on them. And the reason why we've been praising Broya so much in the past few weeks in the past few games is because of his threat that he causes in the defense and and the fact that they actually because of his pace have to stay back and and essentially have to move their players in in their own in their own half and, and it really mm. does affect the affect the way that the the opposition plays and today with with the players we had on field we really managed to do that and with those passes uh Salzburg did feel a little scared I must say in terms of them coming out and and committing too much too many players in attack which was which is always nice to see as well and special mention today, I think that went under radar with uh, when Connor Gallagher. I mean, it, it, he's gone a bit under radar from because of those two mm. incredible goals from from Havertz and and um, uh, Kovacic. But he played it quite an important part in in creating those chances and and trying to find those spaces. I mean, three chances created. I know I'm going to get into stats here, but not a lot of people are going to appreciate the fact that I'm mentioning a lot of stray stats. But three three chances created. Uh, 64 touches, uh, 67% dribbling rate, two out of three, mm. and uh, quite a lot of crosses and, and long balls. So uh, credit to him for for creating those opportunities for our attacking players. And it's always nice to see that coming from midfield. And I know a lot of people are going to come and, and say, well, Mountain could do better or Gallagher could do better. But it's always amazing to have two amazing chance creators like Gallagher and Mount both that? at the time. Can you try again? My yeah. Apple Watch agrees. Yeah. Um, mm. <laughs> but... Yeah, it, it's always it's always nice to have have those two around, and and I think Mount did come on, but right at the end of the game, uh, just to try and neutralize uh, some t- some time and uh, to waste some time. But your your thoughts on the midfield and in Gallagher and and Jorginho and the way they played tonight? Yeah, look, I thought there was there was a lot of positives to take from the midfield composition tonight. We as as we mentioned, we did interestingly concede more shots in total at the end 16 versus 15 but that's due to that the last gasp rush from Salzburg and, and that's really attributed to the fact that despite our dominance particularly in the first half slightly edge of the second where we just failed to convert that dominance and gave them hope obviously they equalized we got a real deal of a second but again it's just one of those situations where we didn't fully put our foot down and separate ourselves and gave them that hope and that invited those extra shots and extra pressure. But the midfield itself, I felt we we largely controlled Salzburg. We pinned them back. We had, you know, the lion's share of possession, which which we tend to have, but have sort of dropped off in recent games against United and Brentford, but in the second half, that is. But overall, I felt there were, there are some still issues in terms of the balance in the composition in terms of Gallagher we know is a more forward minded midfielder he could play box to box of course he's very good at that but he's more naturally forward thinking I thought Jorginho and Kovacic because they they are in a lot in great sync at and you know what you're going to get from them in terms of their interconnectivity but sometimes I think based on the opponent where they allow us to enter their half and dominate and dictate the play. And Mateo Kovacic has got that unique ability to be able to receive the ball and be able to dribble through a very narrow area. But sometimes that can lead to a false sense of security when we are constantly living in the opponent's half and Jorginho and Kovacic both find themselves in really advanced areas. 
at the moment that we do have a loose touch. There is a lot of space to be exploited. And had we versed a stronger opposition, with all due respect, we could have been exposed a lot more um, fatally in terms of conceding a goal or two more. So, look, I think overall they played well, but Graham will no doubt know, geez, there's a lot of space there and we really need to figure out a way in which we're a little bit more disciplined there and not get too complacent or too comfortable just because we're enjoying large spells of possession. So, yeah, as, as I'd say positive for the most part, but there are some elements where they really need to fix some things there because it can be a real problem area for us. While we're talking about midfield, and I know this is moving a bit away from the game, but talking about the situation with Zachariah, I think a lot of us mm. uh, Chelsea fans are a bit confused to why we would sign a player like Zachariah and uh, actually get him on loan but and not even give him a chance so far because we've got a very busy schedule. We know... He, he was signed because of his number six abilities or to be able to play in that number six role and and cover up for for the games Kante would miss. But we haven't seen much of him so far. Potter said that he's not ready yet. He's not. There were rumors about him not being match fit or some somewhat or uh, all these reports coming out. But it, it just seems a little bit off to me that Zachariah, who we've we, we've gotten for a year and hasn't featured yet in this busy period. Kante has been injured and we've been complaining about maybe the lack of pace Jorginho has or the fact that players can blister past Jorginho, but we're not giving Zachariah that chance. And even next week, we've got Zagreb, which it's not a pointless game, but it's a game where we might want to test out a few other things. We might want to play players who haven't got enough time yet. And solely because we've already qualified and it's time for us to just rest the players. And and obviously that big game against Arsenal on the weekend, it's not going to be an easy game. I know it's at home, but Arsenal have been incredible this season. So that's going to be one to watch out for. But um, your thoughts on Zakaria and, and the way we've treated, I guess, Zakaria right now, because we haven't even given him a, a single minute, if I'm not wrong, in this in this campaign so mm. far since he's come in. No, you're spot on. There's a lot, a lot of conversation around this signing and the context is, of course, we brought him in during the two, end of the Tuchel era and it was seen largely as a bit of a last-minute acquisition because we're unable to land some of our other targets. And obviously, the backdrop is midfield wasn't the only area, although it has been an area in which we have failed to significantly reinvest and have depended on some quality midfielders. Again, there's a debate about whether or not the individual quality blends together enough to make a collectively optimal combination. But the individuals have been good in themselves, Kovacic, Jorginho, Kante, of course, and now Loftus-Cheek, who I think we should pay some credit to in a moment. But Zakaria, you feel, you've got to feel sorry for him because he was brought in, I'm sure, with some expectation that not, not that he'd be a starting player, but at least have some contribution or an opportunity to impress, but equally for being balanced and fair, he didn't get the time under Tuchel, of course, because he left very quickly. But under Graham Potter, he has been giving players, um, even the fringe ones, an opportunity to impress. And while he's saying some very complimentary things, I think reading between the lines, there's probably some suggestions there that, based on what he's delivering a train, simply isn't good enough compared to what the other options are. So, yes, I feel sorry for him. Yes, I think perhaps he could be given an opportunity for a few minutes here and there to preserve some energy and fatigue management, et cetera. But equally, you've got to show the manager and the coaching staff that you earn those minutes. So I think it's a two-way street here. So I think this one was is a definitely a one to watch. But if I was a betting man, I'd say that he's more likely to be on the outer. It's just a matter of if it's in January or if it's at the end of the season. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that ends up because I was really looking forward to seeing him at Chelsea and um, mm. us not being able to, I guess, sign Declan Rice yet and, and having those issues with Kante's injuries and the lack of playing time. I would have thought Zakaria would have been that gap for us for now and then until we were able to um, go and get Declan Rice because it just seems like Bully's coming here with an intent to try and buy out every player that Potter 
really likes playing with and, and works with the system. And we've we've already set out some targets for January. And we've, there's already conversations about the next summer window as well and how Boldy wants to wrap up things way earlier than what Chelsea's been used to doing on deadline days or a week or two weeks before the transfer window closes. Uh, but it, it just it just goes it goes to show what how much dedication Boldy has to to running this club and unlike a few other club owners. So it's always nice to have that as well. Um, in in the defensive aspects, yes, we did uh, only, yes, we conceded one goal, but at the same time, as Travis asks as well, and I'm going to put in, uh, put in this question as well, but, and despite the better, better attacking play and three points, how concerned are you by these tactical roles today uh, in, in resulting in 16 shots for Salzburg and Kepa having to put in a lot of effort to try and save those seven of those were on target if i'm not wrong and mm. he says it's it's a bit concerning in his opinion but what are your thoughts on it and then i'll i'll, I'll give in my thoughts it just to me comes down to risk appetite and what i mean by that is we knew what the stakes were at the start of the at the start of the match in terms of a win here secures our progress so that's the objective we want to progress winning this game gets us there i think Travis then obviously again have a tremendous amount of admiration and respect for the statistical and analytical view Travis brings and that's why we work together quite often so make sure you check him out. If I was looking at a longer sample period, I think if we were to have this kind of approach more generally speaking, I would have a lot more concerns because I think it's unsustainable. That's the key word. It's this, I think, Graham Potter has picked this particular setup, personnel and approach for this particular occasion, for this particular opponent, knowing that they are incredibly difficult to be at home and they hadn't lost for 18 months, thereabouts, based on what the commentary was. We know that they have the ability to be able to break in, in numbers and play a higher line. We do know this and we do know that if we are going to try to get the win here, we need to think a little bit more progressively and take a little bit more risk from an effect, from an attacking point of view. So I think it's concerning if we continue to maintain this approach for future fixtures because we did ride our luck, as we mentioned earlier. The balance wasn't quite right in terms of the midfield, though they played very well. There were some question marks about playing Pulisic and Sterling in wingback situations because they're not familiar with them, but they gave a good shift. All of these factors, when you put them together, lead to unsustainability. So for this particular match, I was comfortable with it because obviously we've got the result, but not just the result. We played well enough to win by a few goals. We might have conceded a couple, but on another day, we score a few more as well. So again, for this particular occasion, comfortable with the approach but going forward i'd want to see a little bit more structure compactness and well-defined roles because yeah it was a little bit rocks and diamonds and fortunately for us we just produced more diamonds here yeah and as you mentioned the the lineup has a lot to do with it as well and uh we've got what three or four defensive players who are unable to play and those are first choice defensive players in fafana reese james and chilwell mm. wasn't playing as well today so when you've got Sterling and Pulisic as right wing, right and left wing backs, you kind of expect your defense to be a little bit more exposed because of them not being naturally defensive uh, players, and they they they're more needed up up the field. And when you've got someone like Thiago Silva who's playing week in week out, he also needs some rest as well. So it's it's more of a it's more of a where. Yes, we did concede that goal. Yes, there were a lot of sh shots, but in the end of the day, if we've got our back line and if we've got players in that back four or back three, whichever one we play, where we've got Fafana coming in, we've we've not got Asby, but Reese James and Chilwell and Kukurea, we might end up playing a lot better than uh, or or blocking those shots and not even Kepa having to save those. So it's 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 something that I'm sure Potter is going to look into. And as as RJ mentioned, this is I think this was just because of this game where we were more. I guess this formation was more favoring the attacking players and the attacking style of play that 
the defense wasn't as much of a worry for for Potter coming into this game, and and there's a lot to take in from this game in terms of defense and and what to play in midfield as well, because that's a big factor as well in terms of the the shots that are that are blocked. And I want to point out Jorginho actually. I know we we skipped past that a little bit, but Jorginho today was quite vocal. I heard him quite a few times as well when when there was no commentary on, and he was trying to get get the back three. Uh, properly fixed up and then in transitions he was trying to make sure the players were in the right position so a big shout out to, to him for for doing that and it's always nice to see him lead as well when when Aspie is not playing and and him yeah. and Silva are in there in the mm. midfield and, just on Jorginho uh, I was just going to mention man I'm sorry to interject but I, I totally agree with what you're saying with Jorginho he's we all know appreciate the strengths he brings in terms of the instructions he provides and he's he's seen to be a manager's dream in that sense that he's very good at, at educating players on the field because the manager can't talk to everybody at the same time. So I think that's one of his, his definite qualities. And we're all cognizant of his limitations being his physical um, inferiority in terms of his speed and lack of athleticism. But he does tend to offset that with, with um, greater awareness and positioning. But on that, there were a couple of occasions where he did get found out because, again, they got a little bit too comfortable with pushing too far ahead and left a lot of space at the back. And even with the goal they conceded, we were playing very aggressively and allowed ourselves to be exposed with lots of space for the counter, which was a brilliant cross and brilliant finish, to be fair. But I think with Jorginho, there was one little moment where I thought it was not relevant to the game, but just to, to speak about the character where where uh, as Peter Quetta came on, he conceded a foul and Jorginho made a point to run over and take off the armband and give it to him. And as Peter Quetta being as humble as, as he is, basically said, oh, don't worry about it, but he gave it to him and made sure that he had the armband. And to me, that just speaks volumes of both the class of Jorginho, the class of as Peter Quetta, not to make a big deal about it, but just a collective team spirit at the moment. So yeah, great shout out for Jorginho because I thought, he does, he does receive a lot of criticism and, and to be balanced that a lot of the time it is warranted and the, the criticism is warranted, but he also should be praised for the positive contributions he makes. So I think you, you did well to call him out. Yep, I agreed with that. I agreed with everything you say on that, RJ. And uh, in terms of talking about, obviously, there were a few man-of-the-match performances, but for me, Chalaba standing out again today with his defensive roles, his attacking roles as well. And what Silva used to do and still does for Chelsea, pinging those long balls in, making those passes into the final third, Chalaba started doing that. So it's incredible to see that. And as RJ mentioned right at the start how Chelsea like to play from the back now, how we're trying to create those chances using our defensive players as part of our attack and, and to try and recover those balls in 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 their in the opposition's box or in the final third. So Chalaba, big shout out to him. I know there's going to be a lot of conversations around him up until the World Cup uh, squad is announced and if he's going to make the squad or not. And there's not been a lot of conversation in terms of Southgate saying anything. So it's just... Uh, it's just uncertain whether he's going to be able to go in or not. But for me, I think he makes that team so far with his performances under Potter. And tonight as well, the amount of clearances he made, the amount of blocks he made and the tackles that, that were on point, uh, making sure that we didn't go one or two more goals down. And, you know, as much as we can we can talk about those, those goals that we score, the three or four goals that we're scoring every game, we have to give credit to players like Chalaba because they keep us in the game. They make sure we don't concede. We uh, take our chances. Uh, your quick thoughts on, on Chalaba and the way he's been playing under Potter in tonight's performance. Yeah, I've been very complimentary of Trev. And I think obviously his rise of last season at the start was quite a story in itself. And obviously he, it petered out a little bit in the back half of the season and he had a couple of nervy moments, I think it's fair to say. And, and that, and that, is part and parcel of a young player trying to find their feet in the world of the Premier League, which is unforgiving when you make a mistake. But I felt at times he was probably overly criticised and judged and missed out on some further minutes based on the great start he did have. But what he has shown, particularly under coming under Graham Potter, is a newfound level of maturity. He's refined his game. He has made the odd mistake here or there 
but he's all, he's also now shown more signs of leadership abilities in terms of playing centrally in the back three, being more vocal. You can see it tonight in the corners. He's directing people around. He's you know he's high fiving. He's getting people in position. There was a couple of moments where they will played a, 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 a short pass through and they overhit it. So he did very well to marshal the ball out and make sure not to give away a clumsy foul that could have led to a penalty. So all of these factors suggest to me that this is a young man who's already good and set the foundations, but has worked hard on his own game and started to make those incremental improvements. But because he's such a humble character, He's often underrated, I dare say underappreciated, but has become a focal point of our defence, particularly for an ageing, seemingly ageless Thiago Silva. But overall, Trevor Chalabai is a bit of an unsung hero and I think he deserves a lot more respect. And I'm glad to see that he's at least he's being mentioned in the frame for playing for England. Personally speaking, I think he should just keep his head down focused on solidifying the spot in the Chelsea back line, but particularly to take advantage of Fafana and Koulibaly's absences, despite them not playing the same position necessarily. But overall, he should just be taking it game by game and letting the performances do the talking for him. But overall, very impressed with what we're seeing with Trev Chalabon. As, as RJ mentioned, long way to go for the World Cup, so I'm pretty sure he's going to be focusing on what's next. And for Chelsea, that is going uh, to Brighton and the Falmer Stadium uh, down south. And it'll be an interesting one. Graham Potter returning back home. And it'll be very, very interesting to see how we play against Brighton. And we have seen Chelsea have been quite successful in terms of beating Brighton at their own home. At the same time, we have seen some issues rise up as well, but that will be an important match. And it's going to be a good match for Chelsea to regain some form back in the Premier League. Brighton haven't, haven't won their last five games and have generally struggled, even though they're ninth on the table. And since Potter has left, they haven't had the best of results. RJ, just your quick overview on Brighton and what we can expect from Chelsea and if there will be any rotation from Potter or not on that night. Oh, that's that's a that's a that's a difficult one. Anyone that can successfully pick Potter and his team and formation and in changes, <laughs> they deserve all the credit. In the I world. think Thomas Frank right. put it right. Right, he put it very well in that uh, pre-match uh, conversation they were having, and in, in, and he was asking them why do you change so many formations to just stick to one. But you're you're yeah. absolutely right because when I used to think about the, I used to predict the lineups when, when Tuchel and other managers were here and it was quite, I would have been able to get eight or nine players almost right. It would just be the one or two players that would be the concerning ones. But now with Potter, it's just like whether it's a back four, back five, back three, and, and Henning's going to play. But yeah, it's, it's, mm. he keeps it, he keeps everyone guessing. Absolutely. And just as a side note, that little conversation between Thomas Frank and Graham Potter I absolutely love that little content and I, I'd love to see more of that where they put their tribalism to the side and just speak openly amongst respected colleagues because that was that made for great content for me personally. But in terms of the approach for Brighton, it'll be fascinating to see, Graham, how he approaches it because obviously he knows them very, very well and is largely responsible for just how he's been able to get them recognised to being such a progressively respected team. But they've also been playing quite well post Graham. So a lot of credit must be given to the club as a whole and under the new manager, which I'm a big fan of, by the way. And I think he's going to be doing some really good things with Brighton over the next few months once he has time to settle into his own groove. But it'll be emotional for Graham, I imagine, because while Brighton seemed to have respected the move he's made, is essentially Chelsea have looked ripped the lifeblood out of that club by taking not just the manager but the coaching team with them and left them high and dry so to resolve that Brighton have shown not only to not capitulate but have maintained a steady course and have actually still played good football I think they're going to be really up for this clash and it'll be a very emotionally charged one for Graham because he would have known how they felt by all of that so I think in terms of tactically It'll be interesting to see how he goes about trying to exploit them because he knows their weaknesses. He knows how attacking-minded they can be with, obviously, the likes of Trossard, who can be very dangerous and can score out of anywhere. But I think for us, 
it'll be interesting to know whether or not does he have a rabbit out of his hat here to try to find something that he hasn't shared with others. But a personnel, what I what I would expect to see is that some of the players that didn't start tonight, like your Mason Mounts, for example, I think they will be coming straight back into the team. It'll be an interesting question whether or not, based on Kai Havertz's wonder goal in the second half, I think his performance itself was very encouraging, but because of the load and the whole red zone factor in terms of the minutes played, does he look to maybe give Amando a start from the start here because of what he can bring to the team? But it's also concerning, obviously, defensively, we look a bit vulnerable. Thiago Silva, who again was phenomenal tonight, that goal line clearance, the one where he put his body in a line and Simic, who just stood there and he basically backflipped and landed on his neck. So you've got question marks as is Silva going to feel the effects of that? So who comes into place for that? So it'll be interesting to know based on the injury assessment who is going to be able to be ready for that clash. But I'm hoping for us that we do take more of a, um, a more of an attacking based approach because I don't want to sit back and invite Brighton's pressure because I think that can be to our detriment. So it's going to be a fascinating clash, the long and short of it. I just hope whoever gets picked there that we show the same sort of, of courage and progressiveness and try to not be too passive and timid because I think while we were able to hang on tonight, we could have easily conceded a second goal and would have been a very similar narrative of Chelsea are struggling to be able to find that collective resolve to hold out a win. Like obviously the Casemiro header was another example where we had five to 10 minutes of being able just to navigate our way out of it, but we, we succumbed to the pressure and we almost did it again tonight against Salzburg. So the key for us is to back ourselves, to continue playing with that level of progressive nature and hopefully, just hopefully, we find our shooting boots because I, I am concerned slightly with Aubameyang's finishing, Sterling again, despite his positive performance on both sides of the pitch. His dribbling hasn't been perfect. His finishing's a little bit lacklustre and it takes a little bit too long to, to make a decision. So I'm just hoping that whoever starts up front, we're just that little bit more clinical because like we can't keep scoring worldies to bail us out and penalties we're not going to get each game. Adding, adding to your point, I think with Pulisic as well, I want him to start and get some more regular time on there because he's he's been performing really well and it's just about consistency with him. And we haven't had Pulisic for, for a very long time because of the injuries he fa he faced uh, every every now and then. But it's it's nice to have him back and, and Potter should take advantage of that and try and play him as much as he can But because right now he's been performing really well. And with Havertz as well, it's going to be the question of whether he can perform against Brighton, whether he can consistently do what he did today, because we've seen these one-off performances from Havertz, but it's always been a, a one one good game and then a few a few really bad games or a few games where he goes missing and then he comes back as mm. well. So he's going to have those mental thoughts and those issues that you know on the, on the back of the back of his mind. But it's just for him, it's just going to be one of those moments where he just needs to put his head down, really just do what he's capable of because. He knows, we all know as Chelsea fans what he's capable of and what he did in Germany when he was there and how he performed. And, and there's a specific reason why Chelsea paid what they paid for, for Havertz and, and the reason why they were so reluctant to let him go uh, while they let uh, Werner go and, and Lukaku go, obviously Lukaku being uh, because of other issues as well. But in general, Chelsea have a lot of uh, have a lot of trust in Havertz and it's just time for him to just prove it and show what he's what he can do consistently and when we say that, I guess it's not because it's not it's not it's not us expecting him to score two goals or a goal every game or an assist every game. But it's just about having that presence, creating those chances, helping out the team and attacking play. As RJ mentioned, it'll be a very very difficult lineup to to predict. Uh, but it's it's up to Potter to think what he can do uh, on that. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of uh, talk about Carney maybe uh, starting as well. Or maybe saving him for that the last Champions League game and giving him some chance on that mm. one as well. But RJ, uh, just before we we end the podcast, your quick predictions for that Brighton game, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. And if if there would be any goal scorers, who would be who who would they be? 
Yeah, nah, great, great question and very fair enough. You have to put your guests on the spot. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a must. We like to do it ourselves with some quick fire questions as well. So look, my prediction, I'm trying to, trying to be fair and balanced here and appreciate the, the context being it's going to be emotionally filled, as I said to Brighton, I do expect them to step up a gear. And I do expect equally, though, Graham Potter to be equally invested and have that cutting edge in terms of knowing his old players quite well, of course. So I think when you put all those together, it's going to make for a fascinating clash. I'm hoping tonight's performance, the result, of course, is huge, but the general performance in terms of our attacking play, I'm hoping is going to give us that injection of confidence to be able to go out there and respect Brighton but not to the point where we play in a paralyzed state and not and not go out there and be our natural selves. A lot of that, of course, is contingent on who we pick tonight. And I do agree with your shout about Pulisic. I think he's genuinely earned his ability to be given a start. Give, get, give him an hour, see what he can do. Because I do think that he has been quite positive in his recent cameos. So I think we should continue to run with that and reward the... Um, the positive style of play he's bringing. So I think there are some question marks about Sterling, Aubameyang. I think they are, and of course, Kai Havertz, again, he played well tonight, but overall, has he run himself into the ground? Should maybe Amanda be given a start, which I would be inclined to. But in terms of the result, I'm going to be quietly optimistic here. I think we can get the win, not can, but I think we should be able to, on the balance of things, respecting Brighton and their capabilities. I do think that they have their own frailties as well that if, if we play our natural game, can exploit. So as a result, I, I am going to nervously pick a 2-1 win to the Mighty Blues of Chelsea. So, but we'll see, my man. But I, I liked also the point you made about the final Champions League group stage and Kani Chipomeka, who... It's been nice to see him get some serious minutes. And I dare say that now that we have the buffer in the Champions League, I know we haven't secured top spot. And I think AC Milan and Zagreb are nil-nil at this stage. So at the moment, that keeps us in top spot. So if it stays as it is, well, I think AC now is taking the lead, actually. That would put us in top spot, meaning we can give a lot more of our fringe players and prospects a bit of a go so he's hoping we we do secure top spot now so it can give graham potter a bit of a chance to manage his players a little bit more seamlessly yeah exactly what i would say for that situation as well and it's going to be a very interesting game uh, come this saturday against brighton uh both teams would want to prove would have a point to prove with potter trying to go against his old teammates and his old coaching staff uh, which most of most of them did come to Chelsea, but but there are the few that that stayed back. So it'll be very very uh, nice to see him going back. And as as RJ mentioned, it'll be an emotional one for him because his work at Brighton has been incredible, and and what he's what he's done to transform that club as is is always going to be part of that club. And it's it's always going to be nice to see him go back. And it will be an interesting one. RJ, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you coming on and giving us your time and your insights on, on Chelsea and football in general. For those of you following, I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure to follow him on all of his social media pages. You don't want to miss out on anything that he posts on, on, um, uh, on the podcast that he's on, on the articles that he writes, on the tweets as well. Uh, trust me, do make sure to follow him and, and, um watch his content and and you get to learn a lot more about football and and you know someone someone who's so dedicated in watching Chelsea all the way from uh Australia and I'm pretty sure it's what 6 7 a.m right now for you so really really appreciate coming on and, and giving us your time so uh once again for those of you guys watching make sure to subscribe to us and, and follow all of our social media pages for the latest news on Chelsea and uh, match day updates as well as uh follow us on our audio platforms it really helps us and the algorithm to promote the podcast and get more listeners in and we'd really appreciate that but that's it for now uh big game against brighton let's see how potter turns up uh, on that night but until then stay safe and we'll see you next time